Welcome to YBS 10, where we find artists from A to Z who have albums where every track is great. When every track is great, it qualifies as being vinyl worthy. And when an artist has a vinyl worthy album, I go full on Discog Fever and review their entire catalog and see what we think. Today we have The Antlers, not the biggest band, but kind of indie darlings. And to me, that's understandable. Either go check them out now or follow along with me and see what you think. So I first heard of The Antlers when their track Bear landed in my Spotify weekly playlist. That must have been around early 2016, but it's only in the last year or so that I delved deeper into them. Feel free to let me know how you discovered The Antlers, if there's any stories that you want to tell, I'm always interested to hear. Anyways, let's begin. In 2006, they gave us their debut LP, Uprooted, which is under half an hour long, which is, for most people, quite a short album. And let's see how I score it. My overall thoughts on this album is that they were definitely showing good signs of potential with their songwriting. While I'm not always a fan of the lo-fi and very quiet mixing going on here, the roots were laid down for their use of atmosphere as a key element in their music that would continue throughout their career. Going track by track, we start off with First Field, which is less than two minutes long, but it's a lovely little song to kick off their musical career. I like how it weaves between just an acoustic and then adds reverb and then goes back and forth. With track two and three, I do like the songs, however I feel that the lo-fi production let it down for me. With track four, Nashua, I prefer the verses to the chorus and it may grow on me. Track five, it seems easy. I get a sense of thespianism and it's over dramatic and it just feels out of place in the context of the album. Track six, last folk song, only good thing about this one is how short it is. Couldn't wait for it to be over. Track seven, it's nearly a keeper, nearly. With tracks eight and nine, I do however like these quite a fair bit. The ending track, I'm hibernating, I gotta say, wow, what a mood. It captures the spirit of melancholy so well. Okay, so that's their debut and their follow-up came out in 2007. So just a year later, and that was in the attic of the universe. Okay, so my ratings need some explaining, I know. The reason for my ratings of the tracks in this way is because I found that individually no tracks stood out on their own. They hang very delicately together as a whole piece. They do a great job at setting a consistent tone, and at under 27 minutes, it's not overstaying its welcome. I'm not immediately drawn to revisit the album after a couple of listens, but I think that this is a good album overall and understand why some may love it. Hopefully it will grow on me to the point where I find myself wanting to sit through the whole thing, because as you can see, I don't consider any tracks to be outright skippers, which is a must for being vinyl worthy, so who knows, maybe one day this will become vinyl worthy. Okay, 2009 Hospice. This one's the big one. Hospice is without doubt their most discussed album online, and it's mainly due to that Hospice explores an abusive relationship through the allegory of an increasingly codependent patient and caregiver relationship. It's an interesting concept, but let's see how the tracks hold up. Okay, so it's not vinyl worthy, and I may get a lot of hate for my ratings here. Overall, it is a strong album, it's just a little too long for me. And I don't entirely connect with the concept, and I can't imagine myself wanting to come back to this one in quite some time, as the darkness really makes this a mood-dependent one to want to sit through. Starting off with track one prologue, at two and a half minutes long, this feels entirely cuttable. As we get to track two Kettering, it becomes very apparent that the production quality is ramping up. I especially like the use of quiet and loud in this track as well. Track three, Sylvia. I'm not big on this track, I have to say. It could go either way for me still though. That's why I do keep this as a potential grower. But the last few times that I've heard this, it's, it's just not getting there to me. Track four, Atrophy. I believe this one is mostly a victim of its own length. It could be cut off this album and I don't feel like I would miss it. Um, so that's why it's a skipper for me, really. Track five, Bear. 
as I said earlier, this was the very first track that introduced me to the band and I immediately loved this track. The keys have such a pureness to them, it's like the musical equivalent of heroin. It also reminds me of Kate Bush's classic This Woman's Work, which you may remember from all of those charity adverts for donating to children in Africa, I believe it was. You know, it really <laughs> tried to manipulate you into feeling things. I love how it takes you on a journey through the gloomy reality of the character's situation. It's absolutely a pillar of this album, and dare I say, it's a masterpiece. Following Bear is 13, and it's a suitable interlude between the two pillars of the album. Apparently, it's Sharon Van Etten on guest vocals here. I highly recommend checking her out, and especially her song Every Time the Sun Comes Up, as that is an incredible song as well. Alright, and then on to the next pillar, which is two. The combination of the mandolin with Silverman's vocals here is perfect. The whole arrangement with the reverb on the drums and the ambience on the guitars layered over on top of each other with the warm piano, it feels like a battle between hope and despair. I love it. Next is Shiva, and unfortunately this is cuttable for me. It is fine, it's good that it's not much longer than 3 minutes and 45 though, and yeah, I could do without this one on the album. Next up we have Wake, and this one is long. The track earned itself as a keeper for me for its eventual build-up, but it's just a bit too long at the front end for me. And finally we have Epilogue, which uses the same melody of Bear, but it's stripped back to just an acoustic to start with. I think it would have been better to have it cut before the organ at the end as well. So yeah, for a few of you who know the Antlers, I may have shocked some of you when it turned out that this isn't the vinyl worthy album for me. So, which one will it be? Well, it's certainly not 2011's Burst Apart. For track one, I Don't Want Love, it was a really solid start. It's bright enough that it refreshes you from the darkness of hospice, which was direly needed, I would say. And it's just the right length at 3 minutes and 19 seconds. Unfortunately, we get to a skipper immediately after with French Exit, track two. I, I can't help but feel I just want to get this track over and done with every time I put it on. So it's most definitely a skipper. Parenthesis, I'm trying to enjoy it, so I'm letting it have a chance. And then number four, No Widows. I like this, but it does feel too long and it does become background noise at times, but it's just about a keeper, I would say. Track 5 roll together, it's very similar in that regard to track 4, however I do feel a little less warm to this track. But then we get to track 6 and this one's a definite keeper, very solid. 7 is, it kind of reminds me of a noir film, but it doesn't add much for me in the context of the album. Track 8, I actually do like this track, however I prefer the Nicole Atkins version which is on the deluxe version, so I recommend checking that one out instead. And we finish off the album with another two that I enjoy with Corsicana. It gives me Jeff Buckley vibes, especially with the tone of the guitars on this one. And finally, Putting the Dog to Sleep is a pillar. It's the best track for me easily, it's such a beautiful song. There's an incredible vocal performance and the production is brilliant as well. My overall thoughts on this album were that it was good to see that the band explore into more varied sounds on this album. I enjoyed that we are getting something a little bit brighter than what we've had before with their previous works. So yeah, not bad at all. The next year we had an EP with Undersea and this is a real chill out EP. Throughout it uses pulsing synths which do a great job at creating the feeling of being underwater. And when we look at the tracks, you can see that it nearly does get to be in vinyl worthy. Just the final track lets it down for me. But before we talk about Zelda, let me talk about Drift Dive. So with this track, I like everything going on here. The riff, the horns, especially the splash cymbal. I can't help but feel like the mixing of the rest of the drums are a little too loud. I prefer if they were quieter so they blended in more of the track more, but it's a good track overall. 
The next track, Endless Ladder, it is so long, and while I think it could grow on me, it did become more of a drone that went into the background for me, hence the rating. The third track, Crest, this is so smooth. It's got a great groove. The electronic elements work so well combined with what seems to be a corner, I think. And then the final track, Zelda, this is the one that let it down for me. I was really wanting to like this track as I was getting ready to consider buying it on vinyl, but this track just does nothing for me and uh, yeah, I don't want to hear it again. 2014, they gave us Familiars and this is my least favourite album of theirs probably. Which is sad because they started off so strong with their first song, Palace, on the album. Palace itself is an absolutely gorgeous track. The production and Silberman's voice are the best they've ever been in my opinion here. However, when it comes to the rest of the album, having heard the horns on the first track, I thought this is great, I, I love it. But then when it's used in so much abundance on every other track on the album, it makes it feel less special. The three keepers are the standouts on the album for me that I absolutely know I'll enjoy when I hear them next. The rest verges between being background with not much potential to grow on me, so that's why I select them all as being skippers really. And then we get to 2021's Green to Gold. Okay, this is vinyl worthy. So Green to Gold might be the comfiest 47 minutes ever recorded. Peter Silberman says the album was written in early mornings and it's definitely the image it gives me in my head. Listening to this, in my head, I see a beautiful sunrise where the temperature is just in that spot where you don't even realise temperature is something you can sense. But then the sun rays hit you and it's like a warm bath of pleasure. And then there's no care for anything of the past or the future. It's just being in the moment wrapped around the changing of the season. I don't use drugs at the moment. You can believe me or not. <laughs> but goddamn, this would probably be the perfect album to chill out in that altered state of consciousness. We start off with Straw Flower, which is a beautiful instrumental that really sets the setting. Track two, Wheels Roll Home. Peter knows exactly what he's doing here with the lyrics as they're so comfy. Track three, Solstice. Absolute pillar. It is so goddamn beautiful, this song. Tracks four and five, they're great. On five in particular, I love the slide guitar. It's surprising we haven't had more of this on previous albums of theirs, really. From following along with the lyrics, I gather that this is a song about meditation. Six, great track. Seven, volunteer. The lyrics throughout the album are gorgeous, but this one has some of my favorite. And track eight, the title track, Green to Gold. It captures the spirit of the album so well, and it is a pillar for me. Porchlight has an old-timey feel to me with the upright piano, and the brushes on the percussion are so comfy yet again. And then we close off the album with Equinox, and as some have pointed out already, yes, this sounds like time after time with the piano, but it's lovely and it works perfectly. So yeah, I, if I haven't really explained enough why you should listen to Green to Gold, just go and listen to it. I swear, I can't think of many people who wouldn't get something from this album, if not love all of it as much as I do. Okay, I actually did forget that there is the EP Losing Light, which also came out after Green to Gold in 2021. And when it comes to this, I don't think it's essential listening. It's essentially reworks of tracks that come from Green to Gold. And in ways, they get very close to being worthwhile for me. And I would listen to them. However, in the context of them as four tracks together, I do find that there's just not enough there for me to want to come back to this, unfortunately. So I do skip this one. And that does it for this episode. So if you disagree with me, let me know. Give me as much detail as you want, as I'm always interested to hear if anyone really insists on me checking out any track to revisit it for any reason. 
If you disagree with me, absolutely highlight some areas where you think I should revisit a track because I haven't given it a shot. Or if you have any favorites that are different to mine, just any thoughts, I'm always interested to hear. I'm yet to find anyone who agrees with me in every single way yet when it comes to music. Everyone just seems to be so different, it seems. It's very interesting that because I feel like when it comes to things like film, then people are way more likely to agree with each other on that. But when it comes to music, it's so unpredictable how anyone will feel towards it. So if you agree with me that Green to Gold is vinyl worthy and you're interested in getting a copy for yourself, then you may want to check out my pressing review where I let you guys know how my copy sounds, which may influence your decision on which pressing you choose to buy. But for now, this is goodbye. See you soon. Peace and love, peace and love. Bye, 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 bye.